Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Ellensburg, Washington, USA, Japan. It's about uh, 8.48 a.m. here on the west coast of uh, North America. And we will begin our program this morning on plate tectonics at uh, the top of the hour in about 10 minutes or so. Wonderful to see you all. I'll grab my coffee here quick. New York. Um, good morning. Seattle, Cape Town, South Africa. I see that you've been watching quite a bit, Vanessa. It's it's wonderful to, to see you live here. Olympia, Woodenville, plenty of Washington folks. Indianapolis, hello, Mike. Boston, England, UK. Some of those went too fast for me, sorry. You can see we have beautiful sun this morning. <laughs> the Eastern California Shear Zone. Yeah, man. I see the good morning Vietnam. I guess that's a joke. I guess you're not really from Vietnam. In fact, outside of Japan, I'm not sure we've had Finland. Good morning. I'm not sure we've had Germany. Hello. I'm not sure we've had a lot of Asian countries. I mean, we've got uh, Kasim in uh, Pakistan occasionally, but beggars can't be choosers. It's just terrific to have so many of you, Dieter, uh, this morning. So we have sun. Uh, brilliant sun, and I'm still, uh, for these weekend sessions, um, playing the, the sun angle here. I think we're good for a while. Um, there is a breeze. Oh, I've been busy. Last night I was, it was almost dark, and I was out here screwing around with a bunch of cardboard. So I've got, uh, I'm looking into my iPhone to see you, and if you haven't figured it out, I, I have this iPad. This iPhone uh, clamped on to the top of uh, our stepladder. And so I found a couple cardboard boxes. And I had my, uh, whatever you call it, utility knife kind of a thing. So I made this cute little uh, cozy fort just for the iPhone. And I got the foam inside. I got some towels kind of in here and... Uh, so I assume the audio's okay. Do you notice any difference with the audio? I mean, I, I don't want it to be worse because we got a, you know, I don't know, 15 mile an hour, 20 mile an hour wind kind of steadily. And I have noticed we've had problems before with that kind of audio thing. And especially last week during the Seattle session, if you recall, the phone was shaking so much that this, I'm pretty sure it was the shaking of the phone that made the stream go uh, nutso. Good, the audio's good, good. Well, I love the Cozy Fort. We're going in the Cozy Fort again, just briefly this morning. I don't know, you win, I guess. I don't know, this isn't that fun. I don't, I like, I like the going under the blanket with you, but I guess we'll try this. See if it kind of works, I have a couple hand holds. I didn't even try it out, so we'll we'll see if it works at all. But that's that's the experimentation this morning. There's no red flag this morning. There's no red shorts. Iowa, Patrick. Good morning, Bellevue, Washington. Michael. By the way. I did watch the replay of the marathon yesterday. If you weren't with us, we did a columnar basalt thing that 
I was still going 90 minutes later from the start of the, you know, started talking and 90 minutes later we were still at it. So that was, I got to scale that back. That's just, things are getting too, too long. But anyway, I did notice, and I don't think it's an accident. Did you notice? At about 1030, so in other words, you know, about the 90 minute mark, oh, it doesn't matter, just at 1030 local time, it started buffering just a little bit. So that's three times that we've had this buffering problem, this streaming problem in here in Ellensburg at about 1030 a.m. So I'm happy to remember uh, the first couple of these weekend morning things I did, we started at 10. And then halfway through, a couple of you pointed out, it's, it's busting up, it's breaking up about the same time. So, of course, I've jinxed it, but I think switching to the 9 a.m. start, which is early for many of you uh, here on the West Coast, um, I think it was a smart move. Now, now that I've said that, we'll have helicopters and chipmunks and all sorts of stuff, and I'll break up and we'll have four versions of the live stream. And So, anyway, there's... Decent wind right now. You can. This is this is your indicator. The the chia pet hair, the longest hair I've had since 1979. So I'm blowing around pretty good. How much of that can you hear in your audio? You can give it to me straight. A little. Yeah. Well, I like being outside. Um, a few of the early live streams I was in our living room, and it's like being outside. It's geology. You're supposed to be outside, man. So I like the blue sky. I like the natural light, and if we have to deal with a little bit of wind on occasion, we'll do that. However, that being said, you know how weather forecasts are, but our next live stream... Oh, I should show you the schedule. Our next live stream will be Tuesday night at 6 and it's supposed to be, you know, 25 mile an hour winds. So I might have to go. I, I don't, I, I just, once we're above 25 miles an hour sustained, it's just a distraction. And again, I think the buffering starts again because the phone gets thrown around. So I might, I might go into the front porch. We'll try that maybe on Tuesday if, if the forecast holds. But yeah, I've got a brand new schedule for next week. So I won't see you tomorrow night, which is Monday night. That's our normal routine. Um, I'll expand on this idea, but I'm going to do more plate tectonics on Tuesday. I'll tell you more about that when everybody joins us. Wednesday, the Straight Creek Fault. That's a uh, by popular demand. Thursday, Hell's Canyon. That's a deep canyon in the Pacific Northwest. We don't do these on Friday. And then uh, also by request, next weekend... Um, things will get interesting, especially next Sunday. There may be some pushback uh, next Sunday, but I'm a big boy. Literally, literally, I'm a big boy. All right, we got about four minutes left. Who else we got here this morning? This morning's particularly loose. I almost fell asleep a few minutes ago. So, um, I got some rough ideas, but this one is probably going to go more in the direction of where you want to take it. Elko, Nevada. Almost worked in Elko right out of grad school. Working for the gold companies there. Southern Cal. Do we have any kids besides Patrick this morning? Oh, Gavin and Miles. Yeah, of course. Yes. Hello. Good morning, Gavin and Miles, children. Uh, mental health services. Well, thank you. That's uh, the same for me. It's helpful for me, too. Squim. Coeur d'Alene. Hello, Bill. Oregon. Lowell. You know, on my little phone screen, I can only see about three of these at a time, and so when they zip by, they really zip by. Rick. From Georgetown, Kentucky. Good morning. I'll wait for another uh, exotic location. Here's where you make one up. Katmandu. Good morning. 
Lethbridge, that counts. You guys speak English up there? JK. Netherlands. That counts. You all count. Tenasket. John, I need to learn more about your area. I had big plans to go up in the Okanagan and learn as much as I could this summer. Will I be able to go up there? Who knows? Uh, Connell, Colette, and Ava in Portland. Good morning. Nice to see you guys this morning. Did your parents wake you up for this, or have you been up since 5.30? Luxembourg, good morning. Ah, Elaine, Alan. I think my mom kind of forgets about these weekend ones. Maybe she's already checked in, but I should probably call her today, see how things are going. Okay, a couple minutes, let me get my thoughts together and we'll get started. Sound good? Well, a pleasant good morning or good afternoon or good evening to you. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Nick Zentner. I'm here at home. You're at your home, and we're talking about geology again this morning. This is live stream number whatever, and uh, the topic today is plate tectonics. Now, that's a very broad and kind of vanilla title, uh, specifically because I didn't really know what I was going to end up doing with this session, but I knew I wanted to do something along these lines. So I gave it some thought last night as I was walking around the neighborhood and I came up with a plan. So I do have a loose plan for us this morning and I'd like to focus on the early days of plate tectonics. Primarily our goal with this session is to go from the early part of the 20th century with the proposal of Pangaea and continental drift to the exciting decade of the 1960s and look specifically at some things that happened during that decade to blow this whole thing open and to convert then from an old idea, continental drift that didn't have much traction with many, to plate tectonics, which is fully embraced by all scientists around the world, or I should say most, I guess. Not everybody is convinced of anything these days, but we don't need to go there again today. So I mention all of that because here's the schedule I've put together for next week. And I would like to come back. In other words, I think there's too much to discuss about plate tectonics in one session. So I'd like to break things out and reserve Tuesday, which is our next live stream at 6 p.m. Pacific time, to talk about plate boundary activity, convergent plate boundaries. I'd like to talk about subduction on Tuesday. I'd like to talk about um, particular mountain ranges that result from plate tectonics. So that's really not our focus today. So do you understand kind of what I'm after today? 
we're going to try to be disciplined to basically, and let me say it this way, this, today we're looking at the oceans because the, the discoveries on the ocean floor uh, allowed us to understand that plate tectonics is really a thing. So maybe that's the way to say it. Today is ocean floor involving uh, plate tectonics and Tuesday is uh, mountains and uh, what's going on at subduction zones, etc. So if you want to stick with us next week, if the Straight Creek Fault intrigues you, that's a, uh, an, uh, an old fault that exists in Washington. We'll talk about it. It's Hell's Canyon in the Pacific Northwest on Thursday, and then two age-dating lectures uh, next weekend. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started with this session here. Here's how I'd like to start. I'm 57 years old. I was born in 1962. And 1962, 1963 ish, when I was an infant, is when this revolution in science began. Shouldn't say began, but when things really kind of crystallized in many people's minds. And uh, so it's not that long ago. It's not that long ago, is my point. And if you're an old timer watching this, especially if you did a bunch of reading on your own or you learned this in college or high school or whatever in the 1950s, let's say, it depended on who your instructor was, on how much of this new controversial stuff in the late 50s and early 60s you were given. In my case, my first geology class, Geology 101, was taken in the spring of 1984. And I can still remember my professor, I'm not going to name him, on the first day of my Geology 101 class, I had just spent the whole summer in Montana in the mountains. I was super pumped about geology. I wanted to really try to get into this world. And his first message on the first day was, well, young people, it's 1984, Madison, Wisconsin, you missed it. 1960s, 1970s, there's been all this excitement, but the excitement's over. It's all been figured out. Plate tectonics, in other words. And I remember just being sad. Like, what? I'm just getting started and I missed it? I missed all the excitement? So, many of us get asked who influenced us with our teaching career and our teaching style and that sort of thing. And I have a few people to name and my parents are big influences, but much of my style is based on what I didn't like as a student, and that I didn't like. And as a result, I'm always trying to say, let's look to the future. Think of all the unsolved things that haven't been figured out, but that guy chose to say it's all been done already. He kind of had a point. I know what he was trying to say, but it didn't, it didn't uh, work very well, at least with me, and I don't know if anybody else was that uh, alert. So, in the spirit of that comment, of that guy in 1984, I'd like right off the bat to share a document with you, or a publication, which has been on my bookshelf for probably 30 years, and I barely opened it until uh, two nights ago. And it is an exciting, an exciting publication. I don't know if you can find it online, or if, the, if, if you can somehow find an old copy of this, it's called Continents Adrift and uh, Readings from Scientific American with Introductions by J. Tuzo Wilson. We'll talk about him in a second. Publication is uh, Freeman Press. I don't know, is there a title page? This is the copy that was handed to me by Robert Bentley, who was a geologist here at Central for a long time. I guess that's all I've got for you. Copyright 1952, 1955, 1962, 63, 1968, 1969, 1970. So what's so exciting about this? Do you know about Scientific American? I don't even know if it still exists, but that was a main kind of popular science um, publication. And a lot of people read Scientific American regularly to stay up on the latest developments in science. The mind-blowing excitement for me is that these are the actual papers that were written in 1952 and 59 and when I was 62. 
And instead of the usual for me, which is reading kind of a, an account or an a simul, a kind of a summary of these developments in a book or a textbook or something like that, these are the actual papers, select, carefully selected papers to show these major leaps forward in understanding. So I highly re recommend, if you like this topic and you like the discussion this morning, to find continents adrift. And if you're brand new to the idea, kids, if you're brand new to this idea, are you aware that this is a map of our planet that looks familiar to us, but this is a map of our planet that doesn't look familiar to us? So there was a gentleman, and that's where we'll start this morning, in 1912 that proposed that there was a time when our planet had all the continents hooked together. And we'll look at a couple of animations in just a second in the cozy fort to show that. But this proposal of continental drift, where these continents used to fit together like a jigsaw puzzle, was first proposed by a guy named Alfred Wegener, a German scientist. So he goes to the whiteboard, and here's how I'd like to organize my little session here. And by the way, the, each of these live streams gets longer and longer, so no promises, but I'm going to try to really put the brakes on my part of this because I know you'll have a bunch of questions, and some of them I might put off till Monday or Tuesday because we're talking about mountains then. But uh, honest to God, I got to I gotta start uh, uh, tightening up my version of this or my portion of this. So Alfred Wegener in 1912 first proposed this continental drift idea. What's the idea? It's this, that the continents used to have a different configuration and they have now drifted into their present location. Well, that didn't go over very well with most scientists. And it's a sad story. Alfred lived through World War I, where nobody was talking about it because they were busy fighting a world war. And then in the 1920s, after the war, and in the early 1930s, Wegener was very busy trying to compile as much evidence as possible to prove that this thing called Pangaea was actually a thing. And it's a sad story because he passed away in Greenland on one of his expeditions. So he did not live long enough to see his ideas embraced. But of course, we're now we share his ideas over and over and over again. Let's go to continents adrift, shall we? So this is, these are some of the landmark papers in the 1960s. I'm kind of ahead of, no, I'm not, forget the context. Let me just show you some maps. So here are some classic maps that show what continents are those? Africa and South America. They fit together, and there's some geology that matches on those two continents, and that geology only makes sense if you fit the continents together. We've already done this, by the way. We had a supercontinents live stream, so you can go back to that if you want more. I, I love the simplicity and the beauty of these maps. Here's another one. Let's get North America and Europe properly arranged, says Alfred, and we can make sense of that geology. Find another one for you. Ah, eh, that'll do it for now. Okay, so that's not plate tectonics, that's continental drift. And continental drift and Alfred's proposal assumed that these continents were drifting uh, by moving through the ocean floor. Alfred and most of the scientists in the early part of the 20th century assumed that the ocean floors of the world were flat and they were dead and they were boring and they were lifeless. And that if you want to move a continent, say these people 100 years ago, you have to somehow think of a continent as, a, as its own boat. That boat has to be, you know, uh, there has to be an engine on that boat and that boat has to like push its way through, displace the ocean floor that's static. And of course, if you're a mathematician or a physicist, that doesn't make any sense. So the whole thing about continental drift just kind of went away. Oh, by the way, we had another world war. Okay, so now we're down past World War II and we're into the 1950s. And nobody's teaching Pangaea, nobody's teaching continental drift, I don't think, in any classrooms at any level around the, around the world. And then we're after World War II and now we have technologies to make detailed maps of the ocean floor. And I'm not sure you recognize this name I have in 1956, Marie Tharp, 
You might have to Google her. You might have to find some excellent short videos on YouTube about Marie Tharp. She has deservedly gotten a lot of attention in the last few years. Why? Why, why weren't we giving her attention 50 years ago? You know the answer. She was a woman. A woman? Doing geology? Ha! Say all the men back in the 1940s and 50s and even 1960s. In fact, when she was plotting up these beautiful maps of the ocean floor based on this post-World War II data from the bathymetric surveys that we were gathering, sonar, things like that. Let me show you one of Marie's most famous uh, creations, and it truly was a creation. She was combining, she was working at, at Columbia University in New York City. She was combining uh, her art uh, taste with the brand new science coming in from these research ships. And she was making a map of the Atlantic Ocean floor for the first time. Now remember the context of this. Everybody assumed up until Marie's time that the ocean floor was dead and everything else. And yes, there were many other people involved, but I'm focusing on Marie for a number of reasons. The most obvious of which is she was not acknowledged at the time for any of this work. In fact, if you watch a few of those things on Marie, uh, her ideas and her, uh, uh, even her work was kind of uh, viewed as uh, girl talk. That's the phrase that sticks in my memory at least. So we don't need to go there. So this is the Geology 101 textbook that I still have from the University of Wisconsin, 1984. Kenneth Hamblin. And I want you first of all to, I'm gonna zoom in on the price tag here. You see how much this textbook cost in 1984 from the University Bookstore on State Street in, in Madison, Wisconsin? Different time, different time. Textbooks now cost more than $100 easily. It's a total racket, by the way. So just on the inside, whatever you call this, front piece or something, was Marie's work. And if I can push in here, you can see how artistic this is, but also how incredibly accurate it is. And oh my goodness sakes, what is this woman telling us? What is this woman showing us? The ocean floor actually has mountain ranges? That this mid-Atlantic ridge, which turns out to be the biggest mountain range in the world, we didn't even know about it until the 1950s? Are you kidding me? Are you effing kidding me? So that's why Marie and her colleagues were such a huge part of this story. So the main storyline is here is that it's not till the 1950s that people start going, well, wait a minute now, maybe that guy talking about moving continents, maybe there is a chance that's right because we see that the ocean floors look mountainous. And then that sets the stage for when things really go nuts and the, the door just gets blown off this whole thing, Harry Hess was the first guy to look carefully at Marie's maps, and there were some other surveys, etc. And Harry was the first guy to say, well, maybe, maybe this is a place where we're actually creating the seafloor. Maybe that's a place where you actually crack the ocean floor and new stuff comes up. And Harry is basically saying maybe the, the ocean floors are actually alive. Maybe they're actually moving. Maybe it's not continents pushing through a static ocean floor. Maybe the continents and the ocean floors are moving together. And I'll finish the narrative and then we'll get into some specifics. Just a few couple, just two or three years later, these are two very big uh, lines here. J. Tuzo Wilson, a Canadian. If you were with us yesterday, I was talking about this lecturer, uh, this professor, this geophysics professor, Stephen Morris at the University of Toronto. He is the J. Tuzo Wilson professor or whatever. So that's the same school that, that Tuzo Wilson was at. And also Vine and Matthews were using brand new discoveries about magnetic field reversals and how 
uh, the magnetic field of the Earth has been swapping back and forth between normal polarity and reverse polarity, and how that record is laid out beautifully on the ocean floor. So I can try to draw some of that for you, etc. But to finish the narrative then, uh, really by the mid-1960s, many of the major connections were made. And at the same time, uh, Tuzo Wilson is finding the same seafloor spreading signature and moving of ocean floor and destruction of the ocean floor off the coast of Vancouver Island, out at the Juan de Fuca Ridge. And at the same time, Tuzo Wilson is saying, well, we've got this hot spot out in Hawaii and there's a moving plate and a, a trail of older. So it's all kind of coming together in the 1960s, which I, I think you've heard. But again, to see these actual papers with these quite basic, look at this. So this is from a 19, what's the date on this? This is J. Tuzo Wilson in April of 1963, the actual Scientific American article where he's first kind of proposing what we now view as an obvious thing that we have seafloor spreading. And I'm, I'm, I'm a baby now. I'm not even one year old and this guy's doing this and showing all these relationships. And I, I can only imagine being a... Uh, uh, a farmer sitting in your living room and you got your new Scientific American and you're like, what is this? What is all this about? It must have been terribly exciting. Uh, you know, there, there's no animations at this time. There's no internet at this time. There's, there's no television coverage at this time. Uh, this is more uh, stuff from Tuzo Wilson in 1963. He's even got, I love this. I didn't even know this. He's got a fault the Great Glen Fault in Scotland and the details of it. And then he's got that same fault in Nova Scotia, the uh, Cabot Fault. So he's showing on his simple map the continuation of that fault uh, from Scotland over to Nova Scotia. There's an interesting parallel. We now view geology, geologic processes as these kind of kind of slow, gradual things punctuated by catastrophic events. Like think a big Grand Canyon, not a whole lot's happening. And then here comes a side canyon thunderstorm, a big flash flood, and we bring a bunch of boulders in. It's kind of like that in developing scientific ideas as well. It feels like not a whole lot's changing. There's little incremental little tidbits of facts. And, and then boom, somebody does a flash flood. That's pretty much what some of these folks were doing in the 20th century. Okay, that's the context of what we wanna do. Now let me fill you in with a few visuals, a couple specifics, and then I wanna to come to you pretty sooner than later. Uh, so let's go to this other whiteboard and help you see then how we view the difference between continents and plates. And I can do some stuff on the chalkboard, mostly based on your questions that you have, I think. So here's a cross section that I use pretty regularly in my classroom. And it shows the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, that totally unknown mountain range, <laughs> unbelievable, until the 1950s. New York City, San Francisco, so of course this is the North American continent. So the fundamental unit of continental drift, that was Wegener's idea, is the actual continent. Here's a continent, here's the Eurasian continent. But the fundamental unit of what we now view, the main system on planet Earth, as plate tectonics, the fundamental unit of plate tectonics is a tectonic frickin' plate, a tectonic plate. Well, what's the difference then between a tectonic plate and a continent? Well, you can drive from San Francisco to New York City or vice versa. That's a 3,000 mile journey and you're going from sea to shining sea and you're covering, you're crossing the North American continent. But the North American plate is bigger. To cross the North American plate, we go from San Francisco 
to the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. This is one continuous raft, one big block of lithosphere. So based on some other discoveries uh, in the 20th century, we know that from the surface down to about 100 kilometers depth are these rigid blocks that we call lithosphere. And if you break out a block of the lithosphere, that's a tectonic plate. So here's another tectonic plate moving a different direction, the Eurasian plate. And again, the difference between the Eurasian continent and the Eurasian plate is, you know, a difference of a few thousand miles. But you see what we're doing, we're actually moving ocean floor along with the continent. It's not that the continent is somehow pushing its way through. Below 100 kilometers depth worldwide is a different earth interior layer called the asthenosphere. It's mostly solid as well, but it's warm and ductile. It can flow. It's like warm taffy. And so if you break these two plates apart, as we repeatedly do at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, for example, this warm asthenosphere flows up into that crack. It takes advantage of that crack and comes to the surface in the form of volcanism. So the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, even today, is a very active place volcanically. Basalt lava coming up to the surface and feeding this ridge. But instead of building this ridge higher and higher and higher, we have these two active, moving, tectonic plates. This one moves about two inches a year. This one moves about two inches a year. So the Atlantic Ocean, the, the actual Atlantic Ocean, increases in width by four inches every year. Columbus didn't have as far to cross as we do now. Insert laugh track. So this is an active process. And you're like, oh, does this mean that the Earth is getting bigger and bigger and bigger? And the answer is no, because this is the Atlantic Ocean floor. On Tuesday night, we'll talk about destroying ocean crust in the Pacific Basin, a process called subduction, and we return a bunch of that material. But while we have this cross-section, and I'm guessing some of you, especially if some of this is new to you, you might go, well, wait a minute. I thought you said Pangea was a thing. I thought you said that we actually agree with that Wagner guy from 1912, and we do. And you're like, but wait, I thought, I don't have another hand here, but you can see the Atlantic Ocean in the bottom picture, hopefully, and you can see that during Pangea time, the Atlantic Ocean did not exist. So I don't get how this works, you say. Because during Pangea time, which existed between 300 and 200 million years ago, New York City and Lisbon, Portugal, were suburbs of each other. Not really, but you know what I mean. So that means that somehow, all that stuff in green, which is essentially the floor of the Atlantic Ocean, that has to be crust that was created since Pangea started to break apart, and that's absolutely true. And that was the main focal point in the early 1960s. What is happening, says Harry Hess and Vine and Matthews and J. Tuzo Wilson, what is happening at that, that brand newly discovered ridge to somehow create all this crust? And I think I will do that on the chalkboard and then, and then we're coming to you. No, we're doing two things. I'm gonna do something quickly on the chalkboard and then I'm gonna show you some animations in the cozy fort. Nope, we're just going to the cozy fort. All right, we don't need any audio today from the laptop, so I'm, I, I'm not I'm going to screw around with the Bose system. We have, we have uh, robins singing. Can you hear them? Not uh, Heckle and Jekyll, the Jays. Okay, we're going to start. So if I just do this, it's too much glare, I'm sure. Oh, it's not bad, but let's try out my new contraption. Don't drop the laptop. Don't drop the laptop. Don't drop the laptop. Don't drop the laptop. Oh, crap. This is still not going to work. Don't drop the laptop. Uh, 
may be okay. So, this is Marie's work. This is her classic work, but I can zoom right in. Look at how much detail she has. Awkward. Oh, I can't hear, yeah. So, yes, it's true. You can live on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. There is a place where you can actually drink yourself to death on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and that's Iceland. So there's a geologic hotspot that exists right on that guy. But if I zoom back out, I think I just downloaded this this morning, so you can, you can get your own JPEG and just kind of play with it. But obviously a work of art. You're looking at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and that's where this seafloor spreading is happening. And a common analogy is this is like a seams on a giant baseball running through the ocean. Okay, so that's Marie, thanks to you. She passed away, I think about uh, 15 years ago. Uh, I want to show a couple of animations. This one people love. It's very simple, but it does the trick. So here's Alfred saying, look, we had Pangaea as a supercontinent, and it has slowly, those continental blocks have been slowly uh, drifting away from each other to, uh, to, to make their current... I thought I had that on a loop. We'll do it again. So you may have questions about what you see here. This is movement that we now know is for sure in the last 200 million years. We'll do it once more. You'll notice that, that India is doing some kind of crazy dog paddle to the north. That India used to be connected to Antarctica as well as Australia. There's continental shelves in light green. There's the continent themselves in dark green. Okay, next one. I've, I've plugged this guy's YouTube channel before. Christopher Scotees. S-C-O-T-E-S-E, -E, I believe. Christopher Scotees' YouTube channel. He is a pro at making these kinds of animations. So this is also just kind of focusing on continental drift. I need to control this one. Oh, this is not gonna work. I can't get my hand in there. So he's got definite continental positions even before Pangaea. Let me go back, back, back in time, back in time. So this is all cartoonish uh, in the 1960s, but now verified by all this wonderful work. Uh, I'm not pleased with my new cozy fort, so I'm not going to do much more of this, I don't think. Oh, but I have to show you this. Let me show you some physical evidence on the ocean floor that sealed the deal that seafloor spreading is actually a thing. First of all, let me show you a good animation to show you how we're actually making new crust and spreading it away from Iceland or any place in the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, or any place along the crest of the East Pacific Rise, I might, I might add. So there's a different seafloor spreading center in the Pacific Ocean doing a similar thing. So what are you getting? You're getting a seafloor spreading animation. Play. This is from Iris Earthquake YouTube channel. So based on those, all this amazing field evidence that I'm about to share with you, this is what we view as what has been happening at along the crest of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge for the last 200 million years. And out of frame are the two continents, North America and Africa, or North America and Europe, or South America and Africa. Take your pick, whatever latitude you want. And we're creating this ocean crust that we didn't know was possible. The ocean floors are just as active, they're even more active in many cases than the continents are. Okay, what evidence do we have for that? Well, here's what Alfred Wegener in 1912 would have loved to have been able to see. 
kind of a different version of Marie's map. But Alfred kept talking about this incredible capital S. Kids, can you see that the, the West... Oh, I can come in through the side door here. This is cute. Kind of. Not really. Okay. So can you see, kids, that this East Coast of the Americas makes a capital S? And can you see that that same capital S is on the East Coast of Europe and Africa? And can't you see how those kind of look like they fit together? Well, look at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And now look at what we actually make discoveries of. So also in the 1950s, there was sample collection. So go out in a research ship, send something down to the ocean floor, collect a piece of basalt, and figure out the age of the basalt using this new technique called radiometric dating. And what you're looking at is a map of the different ages of the basalt on the ocean floors of the world. And you'll notice that red, if you can read the scale at the bottom, red is brand new lava all the way back to greens and blues, which are lava that's hundreds of millions of years old. But there's a perfect symmetrical pattern on both sides of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and at both sides of the East Pacific Rise. Again, these colors are different ages of the basalt on the ocean floors of the world. And when you get information like that, it becomes very clear that something gradually and consistently is happening. And what we're talking about is creating new ocean floor. Now, what's an obvious question by looking at this map? To me, the obvious question is, why is the red narrow in the Atlantic and so wide in the Pacific? And what's your answer to that question? Correct. The spreading and the creation, I'll say it differently, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is spreading faster, correct, incorrect, let me try again, I'm distracted now by Bijou inside, sorry, let me focus back on you, you're more important than Bijou, temporarily. The spreading of the East Pacific Rise is faster than the spreading of the uh, Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Can you see why? These color bands are wider because we're making more crust every year or every century or every thousand years. We're making more crust and it's spreading faster than we are in the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And then you say, well, why again are we not, you know, getting bigger and bigger as a planet? And the answer is, even though we're spreading faster in the Pacific, we're also destroying all that crust around the edge. You've heard of the Ring of Fire and we'll talk about that next, next time. There is no destruction of ocean crust currently in the Atlantic because of where we are in the supercontinent cycle. All right, still not pleased with the cozy fort. That wasn't as fun as the blanket, was it? All right. Uh, I want to show you one more. I like my blanket. I like my blanket, even though I don't know how to use it properly. I like my blanket. Plus, we're together. Easter Bunny, is he still around? All right, I'm going to show you. Again, this is J. Tuzo Wilson doing all this, writing all these papers in the early to mid 1960s, including him seeing properly the bathymetric stuff on the floor of the Pacific. Always have that sagging problem. Don't say it. And so now we understand you can create lava even without a spreading center. You can create lava with a geologic hotspot, a geologic hotspot says J. Tuzo Wilson. In 19 frickin' 63, he could see it. And even though we still struggle with the origin of these hotspots, we definitely know that this is a thing. Now we're out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, totally unrelated to our seafloor spreading, and yet this is another way to generate volcanism in an ocean basin. So to have the brains, to have the imagination, to have the 
ability to kind of process and assimilate a bunch of new scientific data all coming in in just a few years in the early 60s and the late 50s. Amazing that a guy like that, J. Tuzo Wilson and Vine and Matthews and others who I'm sure I'm not mentioning, were able to put this all together. And I must say, it's possible that I'm just out of it, but it's also possible we haven't had a big leap forward with tectonics worldwide since the 1960s. I mean, um, actually, that's how I'll wrap this up. Yeah, this, this last thing I'll do. I want to read you a couple passages from this main publication that I'm sharing with you today. Again, these are the original papers written as we kind of had these major explosions in understanding and knowledge. So I had a couple of these marked. This is in the preface of this book. This is, Tuzo, this is J. Tuzo Wilson writing this in December of 1971, so this is almost a full decade after he first started public, uh, publishing on this. 1971. Today, many earth scientists believe that within the past decade, a scientific revolution has occurred in their own subject. As before, the new beliefs do not invalidate past observations. The new beliefs depend upon reinterpretations of geology and geophysics and they demonstrate the interdependence of the two disciplines. The acceptance of continental drift has transformed the earth sciences from a group of rather unimaginative studies based on pedestrian interpretations of natural phenomenon. Wow, slam. He roasted those guys. Into a unified science that is exciting and dynamic and that holds out the promise of a great practical advances for the future. So like many of these things, there was tremendous excitement in the air. I was like, oh my God, we cracked the code on all this stuff. It's just gonna be a couple of years before we figure out how to forecast earthquakes and volcanic eruptions and all sorts of other things. Cause we, you know, we, we've done amazing things just here in the, in the 1960s. And I'm not sure we've done as a science, I don't think we've, I'm sure we haven't made these major leaps that rival those major leaps of the 1960s. Okay, 940. I did a little bit better than yesterday about keeping this under wraps. It's time for live Q&A. If you're brand new to us, we have more than 630 people. If you're brand new, this is a live Q&A session. I'm talking to you in real time and type in your questions Uppercase, please. It'll be easier for me to see. And when I watch the replays on these, I always feel kind of bad that I didn't catch all the questions and some of the really excellent questions just slipped through the cracks. I hope you understand. Uh, I'm not skimming over your question because, uh, you know, I don't like you or something. It's just, I'm just grabbing whatever I can read and answer them in real time. Believe me, I like you. I like your sister. I like your mother, I like your father, I like everything about you. Believe me. Please believe me. Could you comment briefly on the contributions of George Flacker in advancing plate tectonics? Just a little bit, Eric. Uh, I know just a bit of George's work. So George was a longtime Alaskan geologist. Um, I, I happened to see him at one of these geology conferences maybe about five years ago, and I had known about him by seeing a couple interviews with him. He was present during the Great Earthquake, the Good Friday Earthquake in Alaska in 1964, and he did, uh, I don't know the details, I, I feel bad about this. I haven't read George's papers, I should, uh, but he was a key person to help understand the application of these new Scientific American articles to the actual effects of that great earthquake in 1964. And I saw George at this escalator and he was in his late 80s probably. I'm not sure if he's still with us, uh, but he was just a sweet guy. And I was just kind of, I'm a big fan, George, and blah, blah, blah. And, and it was a nice exchange. So I, I've been meaning to do more with, about George. So thank you for that. I'll, I'll try to 
work some of that out, some of that up. I've been meaning to do more about just Alaskan stuff in general. I know very little. What do you think of the expanding Earth theory describing plate movement? VK, thank you for the question. I don't know much about it. Um, as we mentioned yesterday, there's a few topics that seem to um, galvanize many different creative thoughts. And it's all good. It's all good to have brand new ways of thinking about it and, and great ideas. I've seen that phrase, expanding earth theory. I haven't learned much about it yet. I'll, I'll put it on my list. Thank you for the question. What are some theories on what is driving the plate movement, says Robert. This is probably me, Robert, being out of it. I'm not a geophysicist, and I have trouble reading those papers when I get motivated to read them. So I think I need to meet the right person by email or in person who can synthesize the last 50 years of, of Earth interior discoveries and help me see what we know now about driving these plates. I'm basically still in the 1980s as far as my understanding, and I don't think we understand what's driving the plates. But we might, and I'm just, I'm just out of it. So there's not a, there's, you'd think something would reach me if it was a major breakthrough in understanding what's driving these plates. I don't think it's there yet. What happens when a spreading zone goes under a continent or goes away or continues? Spreading zone goes under a continent. Yeah, well, um, we've been toying with that idea a little bit on the West Coast here in Washington. And we used to have a much bigger spreading ridge, the East Pacific Rise, which was offshore of the Pacific, of, of, of our coastline. And we have gone over much of that spreading ridge. I think the simple answer is there, is, there are fingerprints of that on the continent. The crust starts to crack open, there's lavas coming up. I'm talking about the chalice magmas between 60 and 40 million years ago. There's a bunch of shallow magmas. There's precious metals. In other words, there's a bunch of weird stuff happening on the continent that appears to be above where this spreading center has slipped beneath the continent. But to note specifically about how active that spreading ridge is still beneath the continent, or if the continent is so thick that it just destroys the spreading ridge, I don't think we know that. Uh, New, New Zealand is unique. South Island subducts opposite to North Island. I'll believe you, David. I don't know much down there. And again, we're not talking about subduction so much tonight. That'll be, that'll be Tuesday night, this morning. That'll be, that'll be Tuesday night. Tuesday will be nothing but mountains of different kinds being created at different kinds of plate boundaries. Uh, is island get? I was just wondering. Says Dieter in in Salzburg. Is island getting those eight inches a year bigger too? Dieter, if you're asking about uh, Iceland, let's say, or, or an island, or maybe you're asking about the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, generally, the dynamics of these ocean plates are in a lateral sense, and so nothing is really continuing to build and build forever out of the ocean. That's the best way I can describe it. So these plates continue to move, and so our piles of lava kind of have a, a finite time frame before they get moved away from the heat source and they no longer build. That wasn't a bad answer, actually, in my opinion. When will the Pacific and North American plates consume the Juan de Fuca plate? 10 million years from now. We've, we've kind of discussed that in previous, previous episodes. What are your thoughts regarding convection cells in the mantle? Yeah, I, that's, that's all we have. Again, with my limited background, that's all we have. You have convection within the mantle. Wilson was describing that in 1963. And you have these lithospheric shells being sent in different directions on top of that, those convecting cells. I don't know, are those convecting cells real? What evidence do we have for the convection in the mantle? If it's just a bunch of P waves and S waves and other kinds of grainy little uh, gonna, uh, images that I can't understand, then um, there's an impasse there. What are your thoughts? Uh, 
I'm wondering if the Pacific plate is thicker than the Atlantic. Uh, no, I don't think so. It might be by a minor amount. Uh, but the difference is the rate of spreading in those two oceans as opposed to the thickness of the ocean crust. If you're asking that because the East Pacific rise is spreading faster, that's an interesting thought. Never thought of that. I can see your logic there. I don't know. Is it about pulling or pushing? Uh, right. So, again, I think we're, we're out of it. Forgive me if you're a geophysicist and it's clear to you. It's just, it's just not clear to me. In addition to convection in the mantle, there's discussion of, oh, well, these plates are just moving because when they dive, we'll talk about it on Tuesday, when they dive, you're kind of like pulling on a tablecloth that's off the end of the table. And so you're going to accelerate the movement of the tablecloth by pulling, by gravity basically pulling on the end of the tablecloth. Or are we truly pushing the tectonic plates away? I don't see how that's possible. But again, I don't have the physics or the math to really back up my instincts. I think some do have that. Well, I know people have that background. But uh, it's not communicated very well to, to guys like me. Iceland, is it possible it was a result of an asteroid impact and not a subsurface hotspot? Jeff, um, those are ideas that are certainly out there. We're really talking about the origins of hotspots, and our hotspots are a direct result of something striking the Earth's surface. We can't rule that out, but it's difficult to find good evidence for that. Can I try to explain the old way of explaining tectonics in geosynclines? Well, Bill and I are the same vintage, I think, and we did have some geology classes as undergraduates in the 1980s where, I don't know, have you had a college professor who's kind of about 30 years behind the times and they're teaching stuff that they taught 30 years earlier? Maybe that's me, I don't know. But I remember taking a couple classes from people at the University of Wisconsin, which was an excellent department and a lot of forward-thinking, excellent people. But yeah, I had a professor talking about eugeosynclines and geosynclines, and I was like, what is this? You're making... So in other words, before the 1960s, the... I'm not going to do it very well here, but the idea is you make mountains by just loading the crust with sediment. And then you have another part of the continent that's, that's kind of doing the opposite. So you kind of have this building and this, in other words, it was all just kind of, uh, kind of a shell game of where you're putting the sediment. There's a bunch of terms. I remember writing them down. I probably still have my notebook. Eugeosyncline. Memorized it for the test, but even then it didn't sound it didn't make a lot of sense to me. Uh, do they know which section of the ridge Silesia formed? Section of the ridge. Uh, Silesia is a big uh, Icelandic shield volcano that used to be on the East Pacific rise off the coast of the Pacific Northwest, and now it's been added uh, to the edge. There's reconstructions of where Silesia was and what section it was, but everything's been overrun and destroyed. Will Iceland split in half? Christopher, yes, it's being split in half every day. And I've never been to Iceland. That's on my list. Like most of us have a list of places we want to go before we leave planet Earth. I'd love to be in Iceland, and you can go to the, the rift itself where you can actually see the Eurasian plate on one side and the North American plate on the other. And there's now GPS receivers on Iceland and you can document, yep, these, that town is going that way, that town is going that way, a couple inches a year. Pretty cool. Mariana's Trench question mark, that's coming on uh, Tuesday, those trenches. But uh, They do a nice job, again, with this publication. They start with some papers from the 1950s. Can I find it easily? And one of the guys, so this is a decade before acceptance or, or major things about tectonics. Yeah, this guy here. What's his name? It's all, they're all he's, right? Robert Fisher and Roger Revell in November of 1955. And they're like... 
let me share with you in 1955 that we've got these places where the ocean floor just drops out of sight. And in November of 1955, we don't understand this, but look, we've got these trenches all around these basically these big ditches on the ocean floor all around the Pacific Ocean Rim with no explanation. Less than a decade later, it's explained. Tremendously exciting. Why is there so little continental crust? Why isn't the whole earth covered with crust? Uh, Louise, um, we view continental crust as being extremely old and basically indestructible. You can think of continents as just big blocks of styrofoam that are, they, they never get uh, destroyed. And so we go back to our earliest days of planet Earth and you can find that history uh, with the continents. But the ocean floors, uh, as we'll discuss on Tuesday night, are thin by comparison and they get destroyed. And so we kind of basically have a finite amount of continental crust that keeps getting moved around by these moving ocean plates. And a much more challenging question to answer is why do we have continental crust at all? Like when the earth started, was it nothing but ocean crust? And then we somehow developed continental crust, which is maybe what you're asking. And that's so far back, that's billions of years ago. B, with the, I'm starting like Carl Sagan now. Um, they're so, we're so far back and the ideas are so crude that uh, I don't have much to say. Could the, could the Yellowstone hotspot temporarily escalate volcanic activity in the Cascades as it went by? Yeah, I suppose it's possible. Tough to prove that. I see your logic. Mariah, eighth grade. Who is current woman geologist doing great stuff? Well, if you go to, um, thank you for the question, Mariah who lives at Dry Falls State Park. I are part, I'm part of a faculty of professors uh, at Central Washington University, the geology department. I don't know what the latest count is, but it's two thirds women and a third of us are guys. And a generation ago, pretty much all the departments were men. And so just in the academic world, there's amazing amounts of work being done by women. Thankfully, this is an inclusive field now. And people of all backgrounds and genders and everything else, we just need smart people. It doesn't really matter what your background is. And there's a climate now where everyone is listened to. Um, so I can't think of somebody, well, Tanya Atwater is, is, was ahead of her time. She probably should have been on this list. So, Mariah, if you're looking to Google somebody, look up uh, Tanya Atwater. No relation to Brian Atwater, by the way, but Tanya was in the 1970s, in the late 1960s, at Santa Barbara, uh, doing major work on the San Andreas Fault. And currently, I, I, I just can't think quickly, but there's, I mean, you don't even really see men versus women anymore. You just, it's just, everybody's presenting interesting work. Does it, and that's a sign of progress, isn't it? I'm not even going, oh, I'm going to, yeah, who'd you listen to at uh, the 10 o'clock hour at this conference? Oh, some woman. I mean, it, it doesn't even enter your mind. It's just like really good talk or terrible talk. Doesn't matter what the, who the person is. There's good and bad everywhere you go. Does it mean that the Pacific plate is being destroyed faster than the Atlantic one? Yes, Evelyn, and please tune in on Tuesday to get more details there. Uh, when will the Pacific and North American plates consume? Oh, I think I just answered that. What are your thoughts regarding convection? Answered that the best I can. Am I back where I shouldn't be? I am back where I shouldn't be. Ian, fifth grade, also living at Dry Fall State Park. The depth of the different layers of Earth. How do geologists know this? Good question, Ian. We, we know a fair amount about the interior of the Earth, not by drilling. The Earth is like a, uh, an apple that's browning in the sun. 
and we've only successfully drilled in into the skin of this apple. We've never drilled into the meat of the apple or certainly the core. We haven't even come close. But we do know some things about the inside of the earth because of how we've sent signals through. We study how earthquake waves travel through the crust. In other words, we have receivers that record the arrival time and we can therefore infer speed of these seismic waves as they travel through different parts of the apple. And therefore we can actually say something about different layers inside of the earth. I had to do that. My mother, don't talk with your mouth full. Too late, I do it in every live stream. Just spit apple on my monitor, which I cleaned up for you after you shamed me about how dirty my screen was, did you notice? Is the Gulf of California the result of North America going across the East Pacific rise? Yeah, pretty much. How much do plates vary in thickness? Any relations to hot spots? There might be some variation in plate thicknesses, but in general, the plates in general, these tectonic plates are all about the same thickness. Regardless if you have continental crust or ocean crust on the surface, they all have a base of at about 100 kilometers depth. That's the way I would view it. So it's like we had this huge lithospheric shell, lithospheric shell that's 100 kilometers thick, and uh, this would only work if you grew up in the upper Midwest, maybe. Then you just take a big ice chipper and you just break off pieces, slabs of individual pieces of ice, so that you can finally get that sidewalk clear after the slush has frozen and it's 5 in the morning and you've got to go to basketball practice before school. Socks! Unfair! Gavin, age 11. Are the east-west lines visible on Google Earth in the Pacific related to spreading? Thank you for the question, Gavin. So I think you're maybe talking... Yep, we lose the sun at a certain point behind the house. I think you're talking about these east-west lines that cross a spreading ridge. And I think that's why the analogy is a uh, giant seams on a baseball, because it kind of looks like the stitching of these seams. If you've ever looked at a baseball, I should have a baseball as a prop. Never thought of that. The best way I can explain that, Gavin, is you're taking something straight, like a line, and you're trying to curve it or stretch it around a ball. Very difficult to take something that's straight and have it stretched over the surface of a planet. And so as a result, it breaks into all those little east-west cracks. Each of those is like a San Andreas fault. Each of those is a transformed plate boundary. So that's a major feature that Marie was able to show us with her beautiful science slash art. The African rift is continents drifting away. More of a comment, really, Jim, than a question, but that's true. Um, what is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, says Daniel? It's a place where the ocean crust in the Atlantic Ocean is being formed. So this is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. It's named pretty well. It's a mountain range. It's a ridge that's running right down the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And so we're, we're constantly making new ocean floor at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and then we're spreading it in opposite directions. And that animation that I showed you in the cozy fort hopefully showed you visually what's going on there. It's a very loud person walking next. Of course, she's 23 and she's by herself, and yet she's talking very loudly. How about three or four more questions and we're done? I gotta go hiking today. It's gonna be a hard hike, I gotta stretch out. Jose asks, what are the major emerging tectonic rifts in North America like the Rio Grande? Yeah, Jose, uh, 
again, it's kind of tied to North America crossing the East Pacific rise, but Nevada continues to spread. The Rio Grande Rift in New Mexico continues to spread. That's a major portion of North America that continues to stretch. And if that spreading continues for a few more million years, that's going to be a new ocean basin. And California will be separate from the rest of North America. Thank God. Uh, yeah. Please find Patrick's question about the asthenosphere. I don't think I can find it. Can you type it again? I'm right down at the fresh comments here. Uh, in other words, the new comments. Are same rocks and geographic formation on South America and East Africa? Uh, I wouldn't say East Africa, but yes, you can. L let me show you. It was fun for me to actually crack open this textbook that I had as a student uh, for a number of reasons. You can actually see my, this isn't about me, right? But wait, can we see it? Yeah. So I had my little yellow highlighter pen, 1984, watching the Salt Lake City Winter Olympics, I remember. Doing my homework, trying to be a good little student, you know, getting into this geology thing. So that's, you know, th this is back when there weren't kind of high quality illustrations. We have Patrick's question yet? There it is. Um, let me read Patrick's before it scrolls away. Patrick, age six. Is the asthenosphere all one piece covering the earth, not broken into plates like the lithosphere? Yes, Patrick. Because, Patrick, you, can you think of something? Can you, do you know what taffy? Have you ever had taffy? And if you put the taffy in the freezer and then you take the taffy out of your freezer the next morning, it's going to be like this. The frozen taffy is going to be like lithosphere. And then you take this, Patrick, and you take your frozen taffy and you have your safety goggles on and you go BAM! And the frozen taffy breaks into a bunch of pieces. That's really what the lithosphere is about. Frozen pieces of taffy broken into pieces. But Patrick, the asthenosphere is the same taffy, but you didn't put it in the freezer. You put it in the microwave. Or you left your warm taffy out in a windowsill with a lot of hot sun in your front porch. And then you try to take your hammer to the warm taffy, Patrick, and it doesn't crack. It flows. So you're right. As we understand it, continuous layer. What was I going to show you here? Oh, yeah. I've always used this concept of a newspaper morning, broken into pieces or ripped into pieces and the newspaper only makes sense if you put those pieces of the newspaper back together. Uh, uh, you know, I use stuff all the time in the classroom and I never really remember where I saw it. Well, this was in my first geology class and I, th this guy Hamblin had this diagram and I really liked it apparently because I I still use it, even though newspapers don't exist anymore. Students are like, mm, newspaper? Tell me about this thing you call a newspaper and a television and a... Okay, I'm gonna look for one more kid, kid question and we're done. And a toast. Thank you for being with us this morning. Oh, good Lord, there's desperation that I get Patrick's question. Oh, thank God I found it. Okay, we always get to a point where I just scroll back and I feel like I get all the questions, but of course I never really do. Okay.
from all that I can see, I've addressed most of them. A toast for you before we sign off. This is the schedule for next week. You are welcome to join us, of course, anytime that you like. More of the, if you enjoyed today and talking about plate tectonics, we'll do more of it on Tuesday night at 6 p.m. Uh, and we're going to be focusing on pretty much the margin of the Pacific Ocean and where we're destroying the ocean crust and where we're making mountains. Basically, all the mountains of the world are now explainable using our plate tectonic mechanics. Straight Creek Fault on Wednesday, Hell's Canyon on Thursday, and both Saturday and Sunday morning next weekend, talking about how we actually come up with ages for these rocks. I don't, I don't even have my coffee anymore. I don't know what happened to that. Probably blew away. So a toast to you. This is to you and your health, your physical and mental health. I hope that you're doing okay. I trust that you're doing okay. And I hope that our little get togethers here are helpful for more than one reason. And hopefully the health of all family members and all friends and all co-workers and everyone in your community uh, are doing well. Here's to you. Mmm. You put your apple in my Tootsie Roll. No, you put your Tootsie Roll in my apple. Trademark 1973, Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. This episode brought to you by Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. You gotta love it. Thank you for joining us. Hope that you enjoy the rest of today. And I'll miss you tomorrow. And I'll see you Tuesday night at 6 p.m. Gotta go. I love you. Goodbye from Ellensburg, Washington.